Thank you. And this is the last in the series that we were calling Introductions. Um, today, I will introduce you to Carrie James Marshall, who is one of the finest painters, figurative painters, working anywhere in the world right now. Um, I like to start out with a self-portrait, and this is a self-portrait, albeit an oddball one. It is Carrie James Marshall's Portrait of the Artist and Vacuum Cleaner. <laughs> and you'll note that this is a large work. It is five feet high. So that's a life-sized vacuum cleaner. And it is so characteristic of Marshall's work to draw on many different sources from the history of art to enrich his own work. So in this case, he is drawing on Jeff Koons and the series that Koons did in the 80s of vacuum cleaners that he raised to the status of high art. But also thinking of icons of African-American photography like Gordon Parks's American Gothic posing, the, the um, cleaning lady in the U.S. Capitol building posing with her mop and broom in front of a flag. And so by putting the vacuum cleaner in front of his own self-portrait, Marshall foregrounds his own working class background. His father was an orderly in a hospital. Um, his, his parents were decidedly working class. Uh, and also how hard it is to see African Americans in a guise that is not a service profession. So we have to sort of look past the vacuum cleaner to get to Carrie James on the wall. Now Marshall was born in Birmingham, Alabama in 1955, the same year Rosa Parks refused to move to the back of the bus. And his family moved to Los Angeles in 1963, just in time for the Watts riots. So Marshall feels like the civil rights movement is his birthright and his work takes on themes of what it is to be a black man in America in the late 20th and early 21st century. Um, he moved to Los Angeles at about eight and two years later his class took a field trip to the LA County Museum of Art. And Marshall remembers being gobsmacked by these two paintings by Paolo Veronese, a 16th century Venetian painter, a contemporary of Titian. These are allegories of navigation. They are big, painting slightly over life-sized figures of men whom Marshall felt looked like comic strip characters come to life. And he said later, uh, quote, these two pictures struck me as the most magnificent things I had ever seen. The figures in these were like superheroes. It was the color, the tone, the drawing, the size. They were extraordinary. They were beyond, unquote. Um, so he was amazed by the power of European painting. But he also, on that same trip, saw this little figure in the African galleries. It is a statuette eight inches high from Ivory Coast, made of wood and cloth and feathers, and it struck him for its weirdness. And he says that what he has been doing ever since is to combine um, the, the power of the Veronese 
with the mystery and power of this African statuette in his work. So that visit to the museum made this boy, this 10-year-old boy, resolve to become an artist. And so he would check out all of the art books at the library. And one of the artists that he came across was Charles White, another not household name, another non-well-known artist, but a terrific artist who was born in 1918 and who worked painting murals for the WPA in the late 30s and early 40s. Primarily, though, White is a graphic artist, and he makes images like this awaken from the unknowing. And this girl sits in front of a table filled with newspapers. She is educating herself. And that is exactly what Marshall did. He is unusual in an artist of his generation for never having uh, received an MFA. In fact, he went to community college uh, for two years, saving up to afford to go to art school, to Otis College of the Arts in Los Angeles uh, for his BA. And he finds it um, a waste of money to get an MFA because he says, every city you live in has a library. And there you can find all of the texts that you could read in a master's program. And he has educated himself. He would, he would go shelf by shelf in the library, just checking out everything, not just art books, biology books, history books, anything with interesting images. And he would pore over these books. Um, but he had no idea that White, who worked, again, in the WPA, was a living artist until he had the opportunity in high school to visit White's studio. And he describes that as like Alice falling through the rabbit hole. It was a foundational experience for him to see not only a real artist's studio, to see how, you know, to see the hard work that goes into the production of paintings and prints and drawings, um, but that it was also an artist of color was extremely important to him. So this work, which we saw on the wall in the self-portrait with vacuum cleaner, is considered transitional in Marshall's career. He was 25 and this was a manifesto at that time. Uh, he decided at 14 he was not going to paint white people. He decided there were quite enough white people on museum walls. And so he would devote his practice to black people. And not only that, but he would make them as black as possible. So there's no misunderstanding what his paintings are about. They are about the experiences of black people. Those people are black. Um, and he is using tempera here, which is the medium that was used in the Italian Renaissance before oil painting was developed. So this very traditional technique uh, that's challenging to handle. Um, and he's making a self-portrait as a shadow of his former self. A self-portrait where the hat is black, the skin is black, and the only definition in the facial features that we get involves the whites of the eyes and the teeth. And he was thinking a lot about visibility of blackness in America and reading books like Invisible Man by Ralph Ellison. And for this painting, he was thinking about both the Invisible Man books of the Western canon, the Ralph Ellison, but also the H.G. Wells 
Invisible Man and the movie with Claude Rains. And so he painted two invisible men naked. The one on the left is the H.G. Wells. And no matter how hard you try, you will never see him because he's invisible. But the man on the right is the Ralph Ellison, invisible man. He is invisible in our culture because of his skin color. And you can see, again, his teeth and the whites of his eyes, things that were judged by slave traders. And if you look more carefully, if you take the time, if you use your attention, you can begin to make out his form. That he has one hand on his hip, the other up at his head in a sort of jaunty pose. That his legs are spread. That he's naked. You can make out his genitals. Um, but the point of this is the difficulty of visibility of black bodies in America. Uh, the absence of black bodies on museum walls. And it was Marshall's project from very early on to begin to place images of people of color, of black Americans, on the walls of major museums. This one ended up in Antwerp, but that wasn't quite his goal, but um, so it happened. And he has said that seeing this painting on the cover of Art News in 1985 um, was another earth-shattering event for him. So for the first time, the work of a figurative black painter appeared on the cover of this major art world journal. And it was Robert Colescott's George Washington Carver crossing the Delaware, his black facing of a famous image from the history of Western art. Um, and in it, Cole Scott is skewering various stereotypes of African American life. Uh, but this gave Marshall hope that there was space in the art world for images of, of black Americans. The um, late 80s, was when Marshall began a series of portraits that he called Lost Boys. And there was a, an autobiographical reason behind these works. Um, he began painting them when his youngest brother was incarcerated. Now for a while, Marshall had thought of being an illustrator of children's books thinking that that would be a really potent way to, oops, to um, affect a lot of young people in particular. And um, the Lost Boys are from a children's book from Peter Pan. The Lost Boys never grow up. They live in Never Neverland. There are no adults to tell them when to go to bed. Um, to tell them to study and so forth. Um, and Marshall used that term to describe the thousands of young black men who were being lost into the prison complexes of America. Um, with the rise of the crack ep epidemic in particular. And so in a different way, these young men are never allowed to grow up, to mature um, in a normal way. They are forced into this society of prison, um, and many of them never grew up at all because of gang violence, because of addiction, because of police violence. 
So he began to make these elegiac portraits. They have this sense of something sorrowful about them, um, and they are just beautifully done. And he was asked by an interviewer what he was looking at, what his sources of inspiration were, and he said that they ranged from mummy portraits, Fayum um, uh, encaustic portraits from Roman Egypt that are these absolutely beautiful portraits but that are also memorial in tone to the portraits of the Italian Renaissance, like Botticelli's tempera painting uh, of a youth. Um, and Marshall has described himself as essentially a Florentine at heart. Uh, but for the backgrounds, he's thinking of mid-century American painting of, um, of drips, of abstract expressionism, of de Kooning, and also of artists of more recent vintage, like Basquiat, um, artists who come out of graffiti art, Basquiat, Herring, and so forth. Um, his black owl has a halo. Um, again, there's something, he's, he's drawing from Renaissance images of saints, but you'll notice how black he is painting these faces. They are absolutely as black as they can be while still retaining some ability to, to give form to the features. And Lost Boys, AKA Baby Brother, um, shows a young man in a shower cap with his jerry curls underneath. Um, and he is surrounded um, by images from vintage Harlequin romance covers of idealized white women. Um, and um, Marshall said that he was interested in standards of American beauty, in how blondes are reputed to have more fun, uh, how even uh, in the African-American community, on the streets, um, the biggest prize that a gang member can have is a beautiful white woman on his arm. And so uh, Marshall wanted to interrogate those, those norms and those preferences in images like this. He culminated his Lost Boys series in this very large painting uh, that he simply calls Lost Boys uh, from 1993. And this refers to or was inspired by um, uh, a, um, a shooting that happened in his neighborhood um, of a, a child who was a latchkey kid and the neighbors called the police because he was listening to a cops and robbers um, TV show at maximum volume. And so they heard shooting, they heard loud voices and yelling. And so the cops came and they knocked on the door and they, the boy didn't hear them, so they broke the door down and he stood up, this 12 year old, and had a water pistol in his hand, and the police shot him dead. That was when um, toy companies began, after that, um, after that tragic death, they began to um, make their water guns bright orange and blue and yellow so that such a mistake could not happen in the future. Um, but it's it's referring to that particular incident, but also to the 
thousands of black children who, because of lives in poverty, because of violence, drive-by shootings, uh, deaths from asthma and other um, childhood illnesses, never get to grow up. So we see two boys, um, one of them driving a muscle car, but the, the kind that you put quarters in outside of the supermarket. It's got power, a dollar a ride, uh, flames along the sides. But on the left, we see the tree of life, uh, a symbol from um, the Judeo-Christian tradition and others, uh, but it's surrounded with police line, do not cross. Um, and there are balls scattered throughout. And there are dates in here that go from June to September. Um, and they are, they go from um, uh, 81 to 93. But they also, those June to September dates are the ones when kids whose parents work are not in school. They're not supervised. They don't have that structure. They get into trouble, which some of them never get out of. That same year, Marshall painted Beauty Examined. So again, he is interested in our standards of beauty. And in this image, we are looking at a corpse in a morgue. And there are um, various illustrations from medical textbooks that he has collaged on. Um, and we find uh, the very dry, um, explanation of this woman's subject, female, black, age 30, five foot three, 148 pounds. Uh, but then elsewhere in uh, the text, it's impossible to read in this slide, are subjective descriptions like big thighs. Um, and um, that is Marshall asking us to think about how we see beauty, the title of this work, um, and how beauty is, of course, only skin deep. Um, and how all of us, no matter what our skin color is, are the same underneath. Our tendons, our bones are the same. And so Marshall is drawing here on Rembrandt, the anatomy lesson of Dr. Tulp. You'll notice that her forearm has been uh, dissected, as has the same forearm in the famous painting by Rembrandt. Um, so he's challenging the whole tradition of art history, but he's also making the viewer look at those tendons, at those bones that are the same in every individual black, brown, uh, white, uh, every skin tone. He's also using, um, in the corner, these images of a young man uh, surrounded by halos. So they look like saints' images. They look like the, uh, the cards, saints' day cards that you might find in a Catholic country. But in giving us a uh, full front face and a profile, they also resemble mugshots, which is something that Warhol um, did in the 1960s. And Warhol, I think, is an important artist for Marshall as well. Uh, so he is, he's drawing on the history of art, the history of science, the fact that African Americans get poorer medical care than their white counterparts. Um, and yet that biologically uh, in our, you know, in everything under the skin, we are genetically all the same. Um, in uh, 1993 as well, a really big year for Kerry James Marshall, he painted De Style. And this work was 
purchased. He showed it at his gallery in Los Angeles. It was purchased like that by the LA County Museum of Art. That had been such an important institution for the uh, child, Marshall. And Marshall says of this painting that it, quote, performed all of the ways that I knew the work needed to perform in order to make it eligible for that museum purchase, end quote. So it is a big painting. It's 10 feet wide. Uh, it is an image of African Americans in a culturally appropriate setting a men's barber shop. Um, and he gives us these um, outrageous hairdos. Uh, the man here is wearing a beehive that we can't imagine even the B-52s women sporting. Um, the man over here has you know, quite a, um, an updo as well, although the barber is doing a simple shade on the patient in the chair. Uh, the patient in the extreme left, uh, we cannot see his hair. We really only see his shirt, but it looks bloodied as if he's been in a fight. Um, but this is the place where you go, where men could go and exchange ideas and, um, and do their grooming and look their best and peacock for society. Uh, so there, there is all of that in this painting, um, but he calls it the style. And that, um, spelled a little differently, S-T-I-J-L, is the name of a major 20th century artistic movement born in the Netherlands, whose most famous proponent is Piet Mondrian of the black and white grid and the three primary colors. And if we look back at the style, we can see that there's a tiled floor as in a Renaissance painting uh, to create the, um, the lines that give the illusion of three-dimensionality. But they also create a black and white grid. And that there are red rectangles and blue rectangles and yellow um, accents, if not precisely rectangles. And that Marshall is incorporating this idea of the modernist grid into this figurative painting. In other words, he knew exactly what he was doing, he knew exactly what he was aiming at, and he succeeded in getting this onto the wall of LACMA and getting it hung. Um, the next year, he began his many, or his gardens series uh, with many mansions. Um, and he would move to Chicago in the early 1990s. Um, so these works refer to the um, housing projects, the public housing developments uh, in Illinois, in Chicago, and elsewhere that often had names like um, gardens. Here he is depicting stateway gardens. Um, but often there was very little garden-like uh, about them. So the IL-222 is the official state designation for this housing development. Um, and we see the buildings, those high rises that would become an absolute nightmare scape um, in the 90s. Uh, in the background, uh, we also see a ribbon with, a, um, with the text, in my mother's house, there are, uh, and then we get what looks like an M and then S-I-O-N-S, -S, but many mansions 
being the title of this work, um, which is a play on Jesus's remark uh, that in my father's house, there are many mansions. Now, Jesus is talking about heaven. And these places were supposed to be havens on earth uh, that turned into quite the opposite. Uh, but in the foreground, we do see flowers. We even see SG, the initials of Stateway Gardens, um, grown in flowers. And we see three men gardening. But they're wearing black pants and white shirts and black ties. In other words, they look like they are dressed for a funeral. And the, the Easter baskets in the foreground look like the kind of thing that people bring to children's graves. So there is a memorial feel about these gardens works as well. Um, in 1994, um, he painted Better Homes, Better Gardens, another work in this series, um, this one IL2-8, Wentworth Gardens. And this one was truly a garden apartment style complex where there's a courtyard in the center and um, every apartment has a view, a bit of green, at least initially. Um, and we see this couple stepping over the banner that says Better Homes, Better Gardens, which reminds us of the famous magazine, Better Homes and Gardens, um, that is aspirational for American um, you know, interior decorating and gardening and so forth. We see this couple that look like they want to make a better life for themselves, and yet they also seem to be um, grasping each other for mutual protection, to strengthen one another. Um, and there's all this graffiti. Um, the Welcome to Wentworth Garden sign is a mess. Um, and he's drawing, again, on abstract expressionism and on dripping and so forth. But he decided after this series that um, he wanted to lose that messiness. Uh, that he wanted every stroke to be uh, obviously deliberate. So his next series is a series of portraits of black scouts. Um, and again, the faces are as close to actual black as Marshall can paint them. Um, so, what we are looking at um, has multiple resonances. Um, in the background, it looks like a bubble from a comic book, something Marshall's very interested in, uh, a speech bubble or a pow or wham. Uh, then we see the American flag, and we see the uniform that we associate with um, the brightest elements of American youth, uh, those who are prepared to be uh, courageous and courteous and prepared and so forth, um, uh, who take on um, leadership roles in their troops and so forth, but with a black, black face. So for the white, gallery-going audience, um, he's combining something that makes people feel very comfortable with something that makes them feel distinctly uncomfortable. A young black man staring at them. A young black man with an earring in one ear, um, uh, with, his, with his patches covered up, his merit badges. Uh, this one is Brownie, um, and she has multiple earrings, um, and possibly more than the scouts would allow. There were scouting troops that did not allow boys to have earrings in the 90s. Um, one, a scout master, um, 
had a gesture which was a scouting gesture, but also a black power gesture. So Marshall is uneasily mixing um, what white America is comfortable with and what makes white America uneasy. Um, it's, uh, you know, he's, he's negotiating a tricky but powerful position there. Uh, in 97, Marshall painted past times. It's a really big painting, almost 10 feet high. Um, and it shows his typically black figures picnicking and listening to music. So coming out of those boom boxes, there's Motown and there's hip hop. There's just my imagination running away with me. Um, and then there's also um, you know, rap lyrics. And these people are dressed in white, tennis white. And what are they doing? They are engaged in really white activities. Croquet, water skiing, golf, although this was already, I think, the Tiger Woods era. Um, so this is, it's kind of a parody, or it's meant to confront us with where the people that live in those projects are not allowed to be in American culture. Uh, you'll notice that there are bluebirds holding up the banner, and um, he may be alluding to the bluebird on um, you know, Uncle Remus's shoulder from the Song of the South, which in um, Marshall's childhood was the only Disney movie that featured African Americans, and it's not really the most shining example. Um, and um, now that Marshall is living in Chicago, the Art Institute of Chicago has become his home base museum. And so um, past times is a restatement of perhaps the Art Institute's most famous painting, Georges Seurat's Sunday on the island of La Grande Jatte, where there are many people, but not one of them is black. And Marshall said he started counting once in the galleries, counting figures. Um, and he got up to more than 300 white figures on the walls of the museum and only two black ones. Uh, so this is what he is aiming to change. So again, looking deeply at the history of art, thinking about the sorts of subject matter that you see there and reworking it into these challenging images where the gazes are equally challenging. Uh, they stare right out at us. Um, and his technique is masterful. Uh, Marshall decided that in order to get his paintings on museum walls, he had to be as good as Veronese. He had to be as good as Hopper or um, you know, Leonardo da Vinci, Delacroix, his icons of past painting. His souvenir series um, recreates a, an, an upper middle class black living room. The kind of room that maybe nobody ever sits in, the kind of room that might have 
uh, dust covers or protectors on the furniture, uh, but the good room of the house, which so often had this banner, we mourn our loss, Martin Luther King and the Kennedy brothers. Uh, so Souvenir, the whole series, is in memory of the, um, in this one, uh, the civil rights movement's martyrs. Uh, Martin Luther King, uh, the, uh, the girls who were killed um, in the um, Ku Klux Klan bombing uh, in Alabama in 1963, um, and, and other icons of the civil rights movement. Um, and they're, they're in the good room where the sort of guardian angel of the house is arranging the furniture. And Marshall patterned this after one of his, you know, one of his relatives' sitting rooms. It has the, the exact sorts of things that she had. Um, and when you get up close, you can begin to see how Marshall paints details in that black, black of his faces, how he shows us the lips, the bridge of the nose, the eyebrows from a distance and maybe from a slide, they, they disappear. But up close, you really begin to see what a brilliant painter Marshall is. And in, in the still life elements, he's drawing on the sorts of still lifes that he would see in the Art Institute in Chicago. And he would make many, many studies for these works, like this one, um, where the central figure has not yet sprouted glitter wings, um, but is just the lady of the house. And as he developed, she becomes a sort of goddess of memory. Um, but uh, these works are as carefully planned as any Renaissance painting. Uh, now, all this time, Marshall um, has been interested in comic books. You'll remember that he described those Veronese um, allegories as looking like superheroes, but on a, on a real scale. And it bothered him that comic books were so white and that even Black Panther was the brainchild of white um, comic book writers. And so he decided to make his own series of comic books, which he has been making continually for nearly a quarter century now. Uh, he calls it Rhythm Master, and his superheroes have powers derived from gods of the Yoruba pantheon, from African gods. Um, so you can see uh, you know, his interest in African art down in here, some of those uh, some of those gods, um, you know, the street life up here, the drummers, uh, and so forth. Um, a, a running sub-theme of them is, uh, involves visits to a museum. Uh, and in this panel, we find the figures speaking in black English, but holding, and, and it's true of many of his works, holding philosophical discussions, uh, but in, um, in idiomatic black English. So the woman you know, confronts the guard saying, excuse me, this still not open? Uh, and the children are ready to go. And the guard says, no, ma'am. But if you come back again in about six months, they've promised it will be open for Black History Month. And um, that, you know, the guards are saying, you know, there's another, there's another family that's never coming back to this museum. Um, and, um, you know, how hard it is to find 
representation. So this series of comic books is something that he has been, um, that, that's been engaging his imagination for years using, using Chicago, using his own city, and so forth. Uh, but it's fascinating. Um, 7 a.m. Sunday, 2003, um, is a strange painting because it combines what looks like on the left the photorealism of the late 1960s and early 1970s right down to a blurred form of a you know, 1960s vehicle as if it were a photograph um, that couldn't capture that movement, um, but it combines it with the op art of the same period, these, um, you know, these strange hexagons and colors and uh, forms. Um, so um, it's, it's a mirage. He has described this painting as like a mirage, a miraculous moment in the context of a mundane, ordinary day. So we can imagine that like the sun hitting that building created some of those optical effects that we see on the right. But by titling his work 7 a.m. Sunday, we almost can't fail to think of Edward Hopper's masterpiece, Early Sunday Morning. Um, and in fact, Marshall has been compared to Hopper as a poet of everyday life. Uh, in 2008, he did a series he called Vignette, uh, where the subject matter he was drawing on was Rococo art, Fragonard and Boucher, and old Valentine's Day cards. Um, both arenas in which you do not find black figures. Uh, so Marshall created this couple, uh, this man spinning around uh, or, or holding aloft his girlfriend, and then the images, 2.0, 2.25, and so forth, um, go around the couple, so capture it in 360 degrees, um, and we see hearts and flowers, the only color in this grisaille painting, grisaille being a, you know, an art historical term for grayscale painting, the only colors are the pink hearts that explode from uh, the pair's heads. Uh, but you'll also notice the fence with the black power fist. Uh, so Marshall has not forgotten that part of his, his work, um, his prime directive. Uh, he made, over the next couple of years, a series of paintings of artists at work, like Untitled, um, where we see um, a, a black woman artist with an enormous palette but what is she painting? A paint by numbers, uh, which is another reference to Andy Warhol, who early in his career made enormous paint by number paintings. Um, now, the woman is painting what we see, essentially. So can you see that that chair is there? And that her top knot is there in red, uh, and sort of the silhouette of her body. Um, she's wearing a, um, a sort of crisscrossing sleeveless vest that looks like it was painted by Jackson Pollock. And her skirt almost looks like it was painted by Vermeer. Um, it has that much volume, the folds are so beautifully rendered. Um, and that palette, what color is not there? There's no black on that palette whatsoever, just you know, primary and secondary colors and lots 
and lots of white. Uh, in 2011, he painted a white person. <laughs> he broke his rule in order to paint Nat Turner with the head of his master. Um, so Nat Turner, the leader of a famous slave rebellion who beheaded his, uh, his cruel uh, and brutal master. Uh, so we see Turner in the foreground, this menacing figure wielding an ax, and we see the severed head there in the background, a severed head that reminds us of several art historical traditions. So look at the way the head is painted um, in grays and blues. Um, it's very much, the head is very much in the style of Chicago artist Ivan Albright, whose work you see on the right. Um, but the, the severed head itself could come from any number of St. John the Baptists or uh, Judas with the head of Holofernes, as we see here. Uh, so he's painting a history painting. That was considered the highest genre for centuries within Western art, to paint a painting that had a narrative that came from the Bible or came from a classical um, Greek or Roman mythology um, or came from actual history as it does here. Um, but this, he's, he's creating a new topic, uh, a new beheading for the history of Western art to grapple with. Um, in 2012, he painted this spectacular School of Beauty, School of Culture, um, which is the female companion to the style. Uh, to his barber shop. Now we are in a beauty parlor and we see women getting their fabulous hairdos, their braids and so forth. Uh, there is so much going on in this image. There are um, you know, powerful foreshortenings like the woman uh, in the red coat and the uh, yellow sleeve, a foreshortening that seems to come right out of Charles White. Um, there are um, you know, interesting things on the walls or tacked up um, to the mirrors and so forth. That's a, you know, a Chris O'Feely poster from the Tate. Uh, there are spectacular hairdos, um, jewelry, um, uh, and other things. But what is the weirdest thing about this painting? What's on the floor? What is that little girl in pink pajamas almost touching? Well, that is the specter of Barbie. That is that um, icon of American beauty, of blondes having more fun, that is there even in the black beauty parlor. Um, and Marshall knows that psychologists have done tests where they, you know, they flash different images in front of people and ask them to rate, you know, whether they're attractive or not, and that even black participants find the blondes the most attractive. Uh, but this is a weird perspective, right? It's the same perspective as the skull in Holbein's The Ambassadors where if you look at it from a particular angle, it resolves into a skull here or a blonde face here, uh, but it, it remains sort of half visible, this ideal of blonde beauty in the black, Barbie, or black beauty parlor and the knowledge of death um, in Holbein's Ambassadors. 
the Academy comes from 2012. Uh, it shows a, a nearly naked model um, you know, with an enormous afro striking a black power pose in a studio that is filled with the colors of the Pan-African flag, uh, with um, prints of African textiles and so forth, but it too is playing off of um, examples of images of uh, the studio in Western art, like the academicians of the Royal Academy, where the women are on the wall, the female painters who were academics, who, who had been elected to the Royal Academy, um, represented by portraits because they can't be in the same room as the male model, the nude, um, and of course, no black faces whatsoever. Um, so Marshall continues with his project of getting black life into the museums. Uh, here in a club scene that plays homage to um, areas of black culture that have joined the mainstream. Jazz, soul, gospel, raps, uh, rap, the blues, and so forth. Um, and in uh, his studio, which was purchased by the Metropolitan uh, Museum, um, he creates what we might consider a sort of self-portrait, except we cannot find Marshall here. He's probably where we are looking at this scene, uh, and you can see the canvas in the left foreground. Um, so Marshall's working here, painting this figure. He has an assistant who is helping the model get the right angle for her head. Uh, behind, you know, there's a, a red backdrop propped up behind her and behind that there are, there are men dressing or undressing for a nude scene, although we don't see that being painted, but it's reminiscent of Courbet's painter's studio uh, in which Courbet is painting a landscape, but there is a gratuitous female nude standing right next to him, uh, just as there is that gratuitous nude there in the background of this work, uh, but where it is a sort of allegorical summing up of Marshall's practice, um, and one that is deeply aware of the many paintings of painters' studios in Western art history from the 17th century onward. His mirror girl um, takes on the aesthetics of the pinup, um, but makes it a private image. Uh, so this is a mirror that shows us the body of a, a black woman who's obviously been trying on different clothes, uh, who's just kind of posing, looking at herself in the mirror. Um, but we imagine that she's also us, the viewer. So it doesn't allow us to make this about the male gaze. Um, it, it doesn't allow us to appropriate this image. Um, and uh, it's also an image of black joy, uh, you know, of a woman with a positive uh, association with her body, a positive relationship uh, with herself. You can see she's even got um, fairy lights hung uh, around the edges of her mirror, uh, but club couple is equally an image of black joy. Uh, it shows us this couple um, posing in a restaurant, drinking some sort of electric blue cocktail, and unbeknownst to the woman, but we are in on the secret, 
the young man is just about to propose. He has that box in his hand that he's showing to the photographer, showing to us um, that he's about to spring on his girlfriend. Um, and Marshall is one of a number of artists who have reclaimed this space of joy, who have insisted that a black artist need not always paint pain and repression and violence, um, addiction, and so forth, um, that joy should also be in the purview of the black figurative painter. But not only should he get to paint joy, Carrie James Marshall should get to paint whatever the heck he wants. And so his gallerist was rather startled when Marshall came up with an entire show of what he called blots. Um, Rorschach-like paintings, big, roughly symmetrical, abstract paintings. Um, because um, he said he wanted to paint, you know, to, to paint something different, to disrupt expectations, um, and that um, he's thinking again about Warhol, he's thinking ab about Rorschach tests as something that we're supposed to see something in. We are supposed to read something into these these blots, um, and that is a way of thinking about looking and seeing and how the brain works to interpret imagery. Um, he didn't do the blots for very long. <laughs> um, in 2015, he painted this untitled policeman. And of course, it was in response to the many deaths at the hands of police of unarmed African-American men, women, and children. Um, so this is a police officer and a black man. So is he a victim? Is he a hero? Is he the bad guy? Marshall doesn't tell us. He wants us to look. Um, and as usual, his figure's gaze is unreadable. And um, this is a complex individual who is playing this role, who has chosen this profession that nevertheless is a profession that is dangerous to his own being if he is out of his uniform. Um, and it's a beautiful and moving image. Um, in 2020, um, Marshall took on um, Audubon. He went to an exhibition of black artists in America and Audubon was included. And we don't actually know Audub Audubon's mother's um, you know, racial identity for certain. It's not thought that his mother was black, although it is thought that his sister's, half-sister's mother was at least part black. Um, so black and part black birds in America. Uh, riffing on Audubon's birds of America, but the crow, sometimes a racial slur, as a black bird, and the goldfinch as a part black bird, um, a, a way of approaching mixed race in, you know, in American culture, uh, and who has the nicer house. Um, now, he's also become recently interested in exquisite corpse 
drawings, uh, which were done by these surrealists where you took a piece of paper and you folded it in, say, four, um, four folds so that you could only see a quarter of the paper and then you drew something there and folded it so you could just see a tiny bit and then flipped it over um, and the next artist would have to draw something um, that, that worked with that and then the next artist, Miro, um, uh, recognizable here, um, and Max Maurice on the bottom whose figure is being, you know, uh, pushed into by that Moreau curve, um, Marshall began making his own exquisite corpses. And these are fascinating works. Some of them are, are big oil paintings. This one happens to be ink and watercolor. Uh, but we have, and he's of course fully conscious of what he has created in the other uh, parts of his, um, of his paper here. Um, but we find the, um, you know, the, the heads at the top, the women bearing bound men on their, on their heads uh, that turn into a sort of fisherman's torso lofting a brilliant colored carp, and then a woman's buttocks facing away from us, um, and then um, legs in a lifeboat. Um, and you could think about the possible associations within these for hours. They are very complex works. So Marshall has tackled just about every um, movement within the history of art that you can imagine. Um, oops, that was, an, that was a slide I took out. Um, so here is an artist. Um, oh, and that's not 2015, sorry, that's 2022. Um, so here is an artist who is working right now um, trying to upset our expectations for what a great artist should paint, for what a black artist should paint, um, for what art looks like in the 20th uh, and 21st century. Uh, an artist who has had to um, train his hand and his eye to be as good as the great artists of the past. And he said he felt fortunate that he was in art school in a time where it was about technique. It was not about expression, uh, you know, expression of the self. Um, it wasn't about, um, you know, it wasn't conceptual. It was about technique. So he had to learn perspective. He had to learn to paint black feathers on a black bird and have them still readable. He had to learn to paint flesh, although he didn't really learn black flesh. He taught himself how to paint this particular brand of very dark flesh. But he wanted all along to change the balance in American museums in particular. So that when boys of color go on those class visits to LA County Museum of Art or Seattle Art Museum or the Art Institute of Chicago, they have role models there on the walls of both the subjects depicted and the hand behind them. Um, and he has succeeded spectacularly well in getting black bodies and black stories onto the walls of museums. Thank you. So I apologize, I have gone a bit long. Um, 
but I am happy to take questions. Uh, yes. In Seattle? Um, sadly, I have not given this talk to a, a, an audience with any um, substantial number of, uh, of black participants. Um, my, my usual Seattle audiences look like this one. Um, so there might be one or two black faces in the audience, rarely more than half a dozen. So no, sadly. Um, yes, in the back. It's an interesting question, isn't it? Um, acrylic on PVC. Um, he doesn't, uh, when, he, when he does paint on canvas, he doesn't stretch it often. So that's PVC, that's PVC. Oh yeah, he's been doing the PVC for a while. Um, I, I think it. I think it's. Um, I think he must like the surface quality that he can get with it, so that it doesn't have any of the texture of canvas. But it's not as hard to deal with as wood. It's much lighter than a panel would be. Um, but I don't know exactly why he switched to painting on PVC. Okay, here's unstretched canvas. So that's mostly what he was doing up until about a decade ago. Um, and I, I do not know, I have not seen, there are lots of interviews with Marshall online. And that's, that's, a, that's a question I have not seen asked, but um, it, he's very generous with his time whenever he's, you know, got a new show in a different city or he's asked to give a commencement address or whatever, he, he'll sit down um, for often a lengthy interview and he's very entertaining to listen to. It's like having your favorite uncle talking about art, um, if your favorite uncle happens to be black. Um, and um, not, not all artists are as good with words as they are with images. Um, so I suspect that somewhere out there in some interview, he has answered that question, but I haven't heard that one. Um, other questions? How many of you knew his work before coming today? So just a few of you. Um, there was a terrific show that was unfortunately not well attended at Seattle Art Museum maybe five or six years ago, um, of Marshall and Micheline Thomas and Robert Colescott. Um, but unfortunately, they did not do a good enough job publicizing it. I should say, though, that Carrie James Marshall is one of the absolute favorite painters of Amawako Boafo, who is the current subject of Seattle Art Museum's major summer exhibition. Uh, Boafo is a painter from Ghana um, and yet is influenced by Marshall and how he, how he paints portraits, how he paints um, African-American experience. Um, and that's also a terrific show and I highly recommend it. So, uh, yes. He can do anything he wants to do with a paintbrush. Yes, absolutely. So what it is, is color swapping. So there's this color box in the corner of that table. Um, and if I were going to be doing, um, if I were going to paint a baker on, um, on the ground, like let's say I'm going to do a ground for an owl. If I were going to do a whole porch on the ground for it, I would draw in some Picasso um, silhouettes, some 
can't carry James Marshall because it's so much fun. Um, but it's also, yeah, it's, it is an enigmatic, kind of abstract, but very central um, little blast of color there. Um, and it, as a colorist, he's quite remarkable. Uh, and you can see again here, it's the Mondrian colors that he's using, black and white, yellow, red, and blue, um, with just a little secondary color and so forth. Remarkable painter. So. Well, thank you so much. I think my next lecture here will be on Hokusai. Is that correct? Um, do you, we're working on that. OK, we don't have dates to announce yet, but um, we're working on that. So thank you so much for um, bearing with the delays in this series. This was the, the only lecture that I can remember over the past 20 years that I had to cancel due to illness. Um, and it was COVID. So thank you so much for coming to see it in, in August. <laughs>